Lord, let me see all that you are, all that you need. Open our ears, Lord, let us hear all that you are, be loud and clear. Please be near. As our praises rise, may your presence fall. Heaven, heaven fall down. And Spirit, Spirit pour out on us all. to go and make disciples among all people in every part of the earth. And uh, around here, that's one of our central priorities. We call that missions, being on mission. And uh, one, one area that we particularly focus on is at-risk youth. We believe that gets at the heart of God. And so that's why we partner with an amazing organization called Remember New. And Remember New is an organization that, that uh, works to uh, end child trafficking, sex trafficking through prevention. And so we have the incredible uh, honor and privilege to partner with them. And I want to introduce to you or reintroduce to you uh, Nikki. Uh, Nikki and David serve in the tech booth. I love Nikki because she She'll run slides up in the booth and she worships and it's encouraging for us. Y'all can't see her, but um, Nikki is an amazing part of the family and she's got some experience with Remember New. So can you just talk a little bit about your experience, kind of your history with Remember New, um, and then just talk about how kind of that relationship has impacted you. What, what have you learned from the kids and the house parents and your experience there? Sure. So 
We, um, my husband David and I went for the first time in 2019 um, together to Kenya, and um, it was a great trip, and then I counted the days till we could go back in 2020, um, not knowing what 2020 was, would bring. I'm really glad we went, um, and so we've gone together both times, so it's also been a really good time for, for us as a couple and as a, as a married couple to serve together, so that's been a really good thing. Um, you asked me what I've learned while I was over there, right? Um, so one of the things is, um, I love going and spending time with the kids, but I think one of the most formative things for me is spending time with the women um, in the kitchen and helping by helping them cook, which takes way longer than them just doing it themselves, to be honest. Um, but just seeing their daily joy and sacrifice and patience with the kids and what they do for those children, um, it's just immeasurable. So I come home hoping that my kids get maybe a little of that, but I'm not sure they would agree with me. Yeah, and the thing I love about this approach is when you look through the Gospels, Jesus goes and meets physical needs, right? It's hard to even think about spiritual needs um, a lot of times until you some of those physical needs are met. So I remember when he does that, these kids don't have to worry so much about the physical things being met. They can just be kids. I love that. So how does, how does your experience with Remember New affect kind of your daily uh, life and relationship with Jesus now? Um, so Jesus calls us to love people wherever we are. And while there are many days where I wish we could just go back to Kenya tomorrow and enjoy the simplicity of life over there and um, just love on those kids, and even though it's hard work to take care of them with no refrigeration and all of those things, it's just such a joyful time for us. Um, and so I miss that, but that's not where we are today. We're here in Indiana as a family, and so we talk a lot about how we can do that here. And one of the things that David and I have been talking to our family about and our, to our children about is safe families and how we can, if, you know, safe families is kind of the same thing. It's, you know, taking care of the kids that need to be taken care of. And so we've been talking about that as a family and working that into our kids' minds on what that could look like and taking some next steps on that. Yep. And I love that, again, about David and Nikki's. They're people that just listen to the Lord and take the next step that he leads them to. And I think that's the basics of following Jesus, right, is what he asks you to do and be obedient to that. Uh, many of you have expressed interest in Kenya and going on a trip. Unfortunately, we had one planned in January, uh, February, and we are postponing that for obvious reasons. It's, it's impacting us a little bit that way. But as you can imagine, we've seen the impact of it here. In the majority world, it impacts them even more. So can you just talk a little bit about how is coronavirus impacting the kids and the homes in Kenya? And then, and then from that, what's a specific way that we can pray? Yeah, so at the beginning of, of coronavirus, they were trying to do online education, but as you can imagine in a third world country, that doesn't look the same as it would look here. So um, I heard that they were trying to do learning over the radio, and Elizabeth was trying to use her hotspot and things like that with her phone, but it just it didn't work. And so that's much of the way it is in a lot of Kenya. And so the country of Kenya has decided to ask, not ask, require all of the children to repeat the grade that they're in for 2020. So they will start again in January. Um, it's kind of a redo that they have to do. So um, just be praying for that, um, praying that the kids, Elizabeth and the house parents have been working with the children this year. And so praying that when they go back to school, it's not starting over, praying that they do get to go back to school in January is a, is a big part of their lives. It also gives the house parents a break. <laughs> so if you can imagine, um, taking care of all of those kids all day, all the time is hard. Yeah, that's good. So if you're interested in connecting with Remember New and, and Kenya specifically, Nick would be a great person to talk to you and come find me and, and I can point you, I'd really point you to Michelle or, or Lacey or somebody that's been on the trip. But um, I want to invite you guys to stand and um, Nikki's just going to pray for Remember New and then uh, get us back into worship this morning. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for um, your provision and your grace and your guidance. You knew that bit. this was coming that before any of way. us but did, you and you imagine, have a plan, Lord. And we praise you and thank you and here. trust you for that. Uh, right now, we just lift up Remember New as an organization in so many countries around the world protecting children from um, just the darkness, Lord. And we thank you for that and for Carl and all that he's done. Lord, and we just ask that you bless the house parents and give them an extra measure of patience and grace. And same with the children, give them the um, attitudes and, and, and ability to go back to school in January with, um, 
with your provision and your guidance at hand. In these things we pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living home who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to bear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken and i am
kingdom of the light, in the kingdom of the light, forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my light, out of darkness, out of shame. Lord, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us this morning, every second, every moment, every hour, that we would see you clearly and that we would respond. And so we lift up 
these next moments to you, asking that you would empower Eric, speak through Eric, Lord, that we would be a people who are ready to receive and cast aside everything that's distracting or that would perhaps prevent us from listening to what you have for us this morning. So we give you all the praise and we bless your name in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to so many in this room, so many of you newer faces, and great to see at least the top third of your uh, faces. Glad you're coming for our physical in-person worship. Great to have you here, and welcome to everyone joining us online, and uh, just so great to have our extended online community continuing to join us. I was at a birthday gathering, gathering last night. Pete Darge turned 50, Sam Darge turned 18, so the Darge house was having this big gathering, and when I was there, I met a young lady named Katie who's been hanging out with Eagle Church and been a part of our congregation as she lives in Southern California. She's been connected to Eagle through our online and through all of our tech crew. So Katie, so glad you could join us. She's a student at Moody Bible. She got connected through the Darge family to Eagle. So that's just another example, right, of like the extended and growing expansive work of during these non-physical gathering days, Jesus Church still moving forward in all of those ways. One pastoral care update I want to bring to you as a church family before we get into the message. Many of you have been asking about Trey Culley. And so uh, just to reset for those of you who aren't aware, Trey, a young man in his 20s, was involved in an accident. He works in the power line uh, industry and, of course, working around power lines when there's accidents. It was a really tragic situation where they had to amputate his arms just below his elbow. So he lost both of his hands and lower part of his arms. This was two weeks ago. And um, thank you for all of you who've been praying, and we were able to take some food to the family this week. Trey is in Fort Wayne, and so he's been still there, and he's still not awake. So the doctors are, I know I said to you last week, they were planning on waking him up. They decided not to wake him up yet. So here's our call to prayer. We're going to pray that the upper part of Trey's right arm in Jesus' name just comes to life. Can you join me in that? Like, we're just going to ask the Lord to resurrect the nerve endings and the muscle and the tissue because it would be super helpful for this young man if they could preserve his elbow joint area of that right arm. And so the doctors are doing everything they can to wait as long as they can possibly wait to close up the right arm. And they're not going to wake Trey up until they close up the right arm. You with me? So a couple things to be praying on that, that this Lord just brings us to life. And there's a, there's a few little hopeful signs there. So we're just going to keep praying into that. And then would you pray for most likely this week, uh, the young man is going to awaken and his last memory will be going to work two Sundays ago. And he's going to awaken to a reality that I know, pray for David and Deanna's parents sitting beside his bed and trying to help him process. Uh, so before we get into the message, can we just pause and pray together? Uh, Jesus, we just lift up the Coley family. We love them so much. And if they're listening and joining us today, we just send our love and prayers to them. And uh, we just unite our hearts now to pray for Trey as we have been. We pray specifically, Lord, that just the God we've been singing about, the God who uh, sends the darkness away and brings life, that Romans says, who calls things that are not as though they are. So in Jesus' name, would you just bring resurrection life to Trey's right arm? Would you restore the tissue and the flesh and the muscle and the nerve endings? Would you just bring life to that area that even the doctors would see tomorrow when they come in, that they'd see color and life coming to that part of his arm? Uh, Lord, if there's any way to save that remaining part of his arm, we pray it would be so. Would you just minister to this young man as he lays, we know in sedation that there's communion and companionship with you. So be Emmanuel, God, with him. And would you just ordain the circumstances by which he'll wake up and guide David and Deanna's parents to know how to parent through a chapter of their life they never imagined living. So we, we pray for Trey, we pray for the Coley family, and we commit this unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. Oh, by the way, before I, we got t-shirts for Pray for Trey. So on your way out today, thank you for Lauren Sears. So she put these t-shirts together, aren't these cool? 
So we can raise some money for the Coley family, and on your way out, you can get some of these. All the proceeds go to them. So thanks, Lauren, for doing that. Just a way we can rally support around prayers for Trey. All right, First John chapter 2, we're in this series we've entitled Guard Your Heart. So last week, we talked about how the whole premise of the series is Proverbs 4, verse 23, where it says, guard your heart above all else. That's key sentence, or key phrase in that verse. Guard your heart above all else, for it sets the course of your life. So we talked about as human beings, God's endowed us. He's, he's given us rule and dominion and authority and capacity to kind of reign over the kingdoms of our lives. And we all have a kingdom. It's the range of our effective will. So our work is a kingdom. Our physical body is a kingdom. Our finances are a kingdom. Our home is a kingdom. Our car is a kingdom. Our, our room or kids, your locker is a kingdom. Your team is a little kingdom. So we're to reign and to rule over the kingdoms of our lives. But as we looked at last week, the single most important kingdom that we have to become very skilled, other translations say, with all diligence, with all vigilance, watch over the kingdom of your heart. So we might be super skilled at running the kingdom at work. Some of you are crazy skilled in what you're doing in the workplace. That's great. Some of you are amazingly skilled at running the kingdoms at home. And some of you kids, amazingly skilled with running your like athletic kingdoms and your teams and your sports and your artistic skills and all those things, like running all those kingdoms. Some of you are crazy skilled at like running the kingdom of your 401k. Those are all good things, but here's where we have to be careful. We can become so skilled at running those kingdoms if we do that at the neglect of the most important kingdom, the kingdom of our heart, we run the risk of landing in this condition in life where we're stockpiled with external accomplishments and we're bankrupt on the interior world of who we're becoming in Jesus. And that's dangerous ground to live on. So we're taking this series and we're talking about for these three weeks, what are three things we want to set guard and watch over because the atmosphere of our world is just charged with these three things right now. Last week we talked about fear. So if you missed last week's message, I encourage you to dial into that. You can watch it online or on our YouTube channel. So fear last week, where Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Is that not an amazing statement of Jesus? He just, it shows you that you have the capacity. It doesn't mean you won't experience the feeling of fear, but you have the ability to say, I don't have to let fear run in and out of my heart. I don't have to give it rule. I don't have to give it dominion. Remember Thomas Akempis quote, it's better to do battle with the enemy when he's at the door. Don't let him in and let him set up camp in the house and try to battle it. Battle him at the door. So Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Take rule, take dominion, step forward and learn how to reign and rule over your heart. We just don't let fear run in and out. Don't let fear be the basis and foundation by which we build our lives and make decisions. That was last week. And this week we're talking about hate. Next week we'll talk about despair. So here's a passage today, 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. John says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Verse 11, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. So this is a favorite metaphor of John. He likes using light and dark to describe life in the kingdom of God. So it's all through his writings. And in this case, he's equating, right? Do you notice how he's equating to live in the stream of hate is to live in the place of death and darkness. So he's equating hate with death and darkness, and he's equating what? To live in the place of love with light and life. Do you see that? Darkness, death, hate, light, life, love. That's the summary of that little section there. And notice, right, in the language of it, and just how he says, if you, if you claim, notice how he says, if you claim to be in the light, who's he speaking to there? 
He's speaking to people who've planted their flag on Jesus' hill. He said, hey, if you've planted your flag on Team Jesus, then hate shouldn't be spewing out of your heart. Like, those are disconnected. You see, it's like stumbling around in the dark. It's like when you lose power at night and you can't find the flashlight and you can't find your phone to figure out where to go. It's that. John says, if you put your flag on Jesus' hill, then hate shouldn't be spewing out of the heart. It should be manifesting in love, much like Kim's devotional was leading to earlier, right? We're sowing seeds towards love, not sowing seeds towards hate. Anybody notice like just how charged the atmosphere is though when it comes to hate? Has anybody been surprised at like their reaction to things lately in 2020? Has anybody like just had those moments where you're like, where did that come from? Or why did I respond that way? Has anybody had that? Like where you're just like, a situation that was kind of what seemed to be a little minor, and you just like, so a couple weeks ago, I'm driving across 65 over here. I'm coming eastbound, and you know how the lanes there coming across the bridge, it's like one lane goes straight, and then there's another lane that goes left, and nobody knows what to do actually with the other lane over there, so DOT work, help us out on this. But anyway, there's, I'm pulling across. I'm in the lane that's going straight because I'm headed eastbound, and then there's this little Honda Civic of a carload of what seemed like college student age to me. They're in the left-hand lane set to turn left onto I-65. Light turns green. I go forward. They think they're in the lane to go forward. They don't turn left on 65. They go forward with me, and of course, it merges down into one. And they just start laying on their horn, and they started using their hand with certain, like, gestures towards me. Like, I'm in the lane going straight. They're in the lane turning. And I'm like, and I'm pretty sure I had a worship song on the radio, and it was the hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Right? This, the song's playing loud on the radio. And inside of me, right at that moment, when they lay on their horn and they put their fingers towards me, I'm like, oh, hope's got a name all right. I want a name right now. I'm ready to come at them. I'm like speeding up, trying to like get close to them to like, I'm like, what am I thinking? We're going like 40 miles. I'm ready to roll my window down and lecture her on how she's in the turn lane. That just, it's just like the atmosphere, the air we're breathing is just charged with, here's the word in the New Testament, translated hate. I put it in your notes. If you haven't pulled out your message notes, you can scan the QR code online. The host can direct you. In your notes, it's the word Maseo. Say Maseo. Here's what it means. It means to hate, detest, to be without love. Isn't that ironic? So what comes, anybody notice like, we haven't had to work very hard to see Maseo come up out of our hearts these days. I mean, it's just, it's right there at the surface because it's like the atmosphere, I feel like it's just rampaging against the door of our heart to have like acrimony and strife and division and hate. It's just barraging, pounding at the door. And that's why John calls out, he says, hey, if you're claiming to be in the kingdom of light, Jesus would say, you need to take some charge over the kingdom of your heart. Don't let that in. But because the environment of 2020 is such and the circumstances we're in, the air we're breathing, it's just sitting right there at the surface. And that's why like Facebook looks like what it looks like. And social media, heaven forbid someone placed some type of post out there that has some type of opinion about something that someone strongly disagrees with. And all of a sudden, you just trace the thread. And you go, these are followers of Jesus speaking about these things in ways that just, it seems there's, there's like a lot of miseo going on, strife and acrimony and contention. And it doesn't mean you can't have a strong opinion. It just means, gang, as a follower of Jesus, to be in the kingdom of light means you can have a dialogue with someone who disagrees with what you see and what you believe and how your conclusions, and you can do it in a respectful and honoring way. Can we not? I happen to believe that's still a possibility, but it isn't possible if we're not watching over the kingdom of our heart. If you just let hate run in and out of your heart right now, it's going to lead you in a place of responding to situations. It's going to show up in your face. It's going to manifest in the tone of your voice. It's going to show up while you're driving. It's going to show up in your casual interactions. It's just, if you just let it run in and out of your heart. Like practically as Christians, I thought about like, let's take an issue like abortion. That's 
so emotionally charged. Rightly so, as followers of Jesus, we should feel strongly about life taking place at conception. No doubt about it. We should be, we should be bannering that, right? That we are pro-life, that God forms life in the womb at conception. Yes, we can feel strongly about it. But do you see how ironic it is? Here's what, here's what John would be calling out. Hey, as anyone in the kingdom of light, if you claim to be in the light, if you plant your flag on Jesus Hill and you say, I'm pro-life, then do you see the irony that says, but I'm going to issue death threats to those who work in the abortion clinic? Anybody else see this? Is it just, so this is what's disconnected. You can't plant your flag on Jesus Hill, say, I'm pro-life, and then you'd be running around saying, I'm going to take someone's life for being in a different camp. That can't be for the followers of Jesus. There's got to be a more respectful and honoring Jesus-like way to disagree, to have dialogue, to have conversations. Are you with me in this? And that, take it any topic. The mask issue, the restrictions issue, should we open up more, should we restrict more? The racial justice and racial tension issue that are forming all across. Do you see just, I think just last night in Portland again, and what happened right when there's this collision of these like, and the ability not to have any type of Christ-centered dialogue about the issue. Do you see like hate just streams up? It's just right there. And we've got to deal with this. And we've got to say, hey, as followers of Jesus, we get to be a part of the conversation. We get to be a part of the solution side. We get to acknowledge the injustice. We get to fight for hope. We get to fight for change. But we need to do it as people in the kingdom of night, light, not stumbling around, around in the dark. We can't be wielding Maseo. You with me? Like Maseo just coming out everywhere. And heaven forbid you begin to form a topic about the election and political thing. Oh, Lord, right? That situation, like, that's just, and that's only going to pick up steam between now and the first part of November. So we got to decide right now, with all diligence, with all vigilance, we got to watch over our hearts. We got to do battle with it at the door. It doesn't mean you're not going to experience the feeling of wanting to respond in a way that's perhaps Maseo-like. It just means you don't have to let it in and let it run in and out of your heart. You don't have to cave into it. You don't have to feed it. You don't have to fuel it. And so that brings us to this question, then, well, how? Practically, how do you do it? Right? Much like last week, how do we guard our heart against fear? How do we guard our heart against fate? Jesus, of course, has the window and the picture into how to do it. Look at Matthew 5. I put this in your notes, 43 and 44. Here's this picture of how to battle against hate at your door. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, that's classic Jesus talk. So here's what Jesus says. Here's what your Instagram feed says, but I tell you. Here's what your Facebook thread says, but I tell you. Here's what the evening news cycle says, but I tell you. Here's what whatever leader says, but I tell you. You know, Jesus right now, he's just speaking right into it. So he's quoting like, that's the common word on the street about how you treat people. You hate on hate, right? There's a whole bunch of that going on in our world, that hate on hate. Jesus says, but I tell you, here's the Jesus way, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow, are you kidding me? What would our world look like if we guarded our hearts from Maseo and lived Matthew 5, 43 and 44? what would it look like? It would take our breath away. If we actually did this, that someone who irritates you, someone who makes your life increasingly difficult, someone who holds a different position, someone who's deeply hurt or offended you, that out of your heart as a follower of Jesus would come, I'm going to love, I'm not going to hate. That you just invoke love and banish hate in Jesus' name. What? I think our world would just be transformed, which is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5. It's the whole Sermon on the Mount. He's given a picture of a different kind of way of being. It doesn't mean we won't have challenging disagreements. It's the way. Jesus is always concerned with the way things are handled. And right now, we can't handle it in the way of hate and be in the kingdom of light. That's like stumbling around in the middle of the dark. So a few weeks ago, here's a picture of, we had Jesse and Lachelle Bingham. You guys remember the Binghams? Jesse and Lachelle Bingham came to our staff. Here's a picture of 
I had to invite them to come to our staff meeting to share some of their hearts around their race and justice and issues of hope and where do we look. And they're such great people. If you don't, remember, what, I interviewed Jesse at the end of May, beginning of June, right after George Floyd was killed. Do you remember that Sunday? If you didn't get to listen to that interview, check it out, go online and listen to it. Jesse did an outstanding job. Jesse pastors at a local church in the inner city of Indianapolis. He was born and raised here. Amazing heart for God, he and his family, doing great work on the Near East Side. Just love him, love all that he stands for. And, and I invited him to come because I said, Jesse, would you come to Whitestown, Indiana, to a big white square building to talk to a fully white staff? Like, we're sitting in a room. Would you, like, help us? We really want to listen. We really want to understand. We want to be a part of the solution. We want to help. We recognize some things. We want to be on the right side of history with this. Like, we want to be where Jesus would want us to be. So we invited Jesse and Lachelle to come. And I just wrote a couple things down that stood out uh, from their interaction with us. Um, We spent about 90 minutes together, and he said this, quote, Jesse said, we can't change things without white people helping us. Isn't that interesting? And he talked about all lives won't matter until black lives matter. All lives matter when black lives matter, and we got to deal with that. And then he said this, the root of the problem is sin, and Jesus is the only answer for that. (laughs) Right? So at the core, Jesse's talking about at the core of what he wants to say as a black pastor in this world is the core is sin in the human heart, irregardless of skin color. And Jesus is the answer for all of that. So that tells me, right, that as we take stewardship of watching over the door of our heart, that we say, hey, I'm going to invoke love and banish hate in Jesus' name. That's how I'm going to be a part of the solution. That's how I'm going to take ownership. I'm not going to allow this to pull me down the wrong road. I'm not going to enter into that thing online. I'm not going to enter into that combative nature. I'm going to try to invoke love and banish hate in this to be a part of solution and change. And then I I thought about um, anybody tuning in on Fridays, we've been hosting a Youth for Christ race, justice, and hope discussion here on stage. It's been going on on Fridays. You can dial in on the live stream on Friday afternoon or evening. I can't remember this week's session, but they've been outstanding. And I'm sure there's available somewhere online or in our channel somewhere, but uh, Allie King and her staff at Youth for Christ doing an outstanding job of helping us be at the table. We want to be at the table. We want to be a part of the solution. We want to engage. We want to listen. We want to understand. We recognize what Jesse said, like if we're going to break change in our country in this area, that white people have to be involved and get, we can't sit on the sideline. We can't be silent. We will step forward in this way. And these are the ways we're doing it. And also this week, I was on a, I was on a, I was on a Skype call um, with the Colts organization. We were all together on a Zoom call together. And it was like, you know, with the Ursay family and GM Chris Ballard and head coach Frank Reich and about... 15 of us that were all just rolling up our sleeves and saying, in light of the platform that an NFL franchise has, how can we use that platform to bring change in these issues in our world? How encouraging is that? That there's a, people wanting to band together. Well, Jesse was a part of that call too. And so, because Jesse works at the Colts facility, he's like the Huntington Bank banker there at the Colts facility. That's his relationship. That's how we got to know each other. But all of us are stepping forward to say white and black and brown, young and old, all of us coming forward to say this, we're going to invoke love and banish hate. We're not going down the way of Maceo to deal with this, but we're going to bring change. We're not going to stop by, we're going to bring change, but we're going to bring change Jesus' way, right? And change Jesus' way starts with dealing with the heart. Right? You can't bring change to these issues in our world by just expecting some new political regime to come into place and fix things or whatever. Gang, that's, the wrong, that's a wrong place to place our hope. We don't put our hope there. Our hope isn't found in the institutions of this world. Our hope is found in what we've been singing about. Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, our living hope. And do you believe with me? He has the power and authority to change what needs to be changed in this world. Do you believe that? 
The church ought to be the one. We believe that with every fiber of our being, that Christ has the power, Christ has the authority, and he's calling his people to a new place, in a new day, in a new way, to set dominion, watch over the door of our heart, and in this specific case, invoke love and banish hate. And when we do that, by the power of his spirit, when we move out into that, we'll start seeing some things change. We'll see some things change. You study the history. You look at the history of our world. And when Jesus' people come together, band together by his spirit, going Christ's way, huh, some things are going to change. Some things are going to change. And I hope that brings some level of hope. It's not going to change overnight. There's no quick fix to these things. It's like hundreds and hundreds of years to get into the mess that we're in. But we begin to take steps forward together. So by invoking love and banishing hate, here's a picture I want you to get. The love we invoke is the love of Christ. Do you see this? There's no shot to live Matthew 5, 43 and 44 in your own power and strength. Anybody tried loving their enemies in their own power and strength? How's that working out? Anybody tried just put that person who's super irritating to you, who's super disappointing to you, who's been super hurtful to you? Anybody tried to put the sticky note on the dashboard that says, hey, love that person? That ain't going to work. What we need is we need the love of Christ to be poured out by the Spirit in our heart. It's Christ's love that we invoke because here's the nature of Christ's love. I put these verses in your notes. I'm going to draw things together with this. We're going to lead us into a time of prayer here in a moment. So Mark 10, here's what it says. Look, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the love of Christ. Do you see that? Where Christ comes to just give himself away. He didn't come, if anyone who had the rightful authority to claim like, hey, serve me, be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he gave himself away. That's what he's calling us as his people. To Mark 10, 45, or John 15, this is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. Jesus said, checkmate. All the hate coming at you as maybe being in the light, stepping into the dark. You're going to get some hate. You're going to get some stuff slung your way. Jesus said, they slung it my way. So don't be shocked. Don't freak out. Don't cower. Don't run in fear. Step forward. Watch over your heart and invoke my love in Jesus' name. Banish hate and invoke love. Remember Martin Luther King's famous words? Hate hate can't drive out hate. Only love's big enough to do that. It was Martin Luther King. He, He rooted it right here love of Christ. Or how about this? Jesus hanging on the cross, Luke 23. He's hanging there. All the injustice. Remember, Jesus is innocent. Do you remember how the scene was? There's a criminal on the right, criminal on the left. Remember that whole scene? Remember prior that uh, Pilate's going to release one of the criminals and says, hey, who are you going to release? List Barabbas, the guilty one, crucify Jesus, the innocent one. All the injustice, all of that's not right. You want to know who understands that? Jesus understands. No one understands injustice like Jesus does. What do we want, justice? What do we want now? Right on the heels of it, Jesus needs to be in that dialogue because he knows about justice. He knows what to do in that space. And he's on the cross and he's hanging there. And here's the amazing line that he says in the midst of all that pain and all that's wrong. And the Romans are strutting around and the religious leaders are strutting around and they think they all got the last word. And here's what Jesus said. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's how he's invoking. That's the power of Christ we need right now. Father, forgive them. Like Kim was saying, we got to put some deposit. we gotta, we got to work the soil in those seeds. Forgive them. Stop working the anger. Stop working the strife and the acrimony and the hate on hate. we got to get out of that. we got to start working this soil right here. Forgiveness and grace. I like what Mark Buchanan said. I put this in your notes. To love those whom you have very reason to hate and to hurt. Personal reasons, visceral reasons, historical reasons, doctrinal reasons, deep-rooted and long-standing reasons. To love those and all that, that takes the Son of God within you. Yep. So I think the battleground is clear, like, culturally and collectively as a human race right now. I don't think we need a ton of dialogue about 
the battles that all being thrust big picture wise in our world today. I want to wrap up by asking, where's the personal battle for you these days? Because all the battles taking place out there, maybe culturally, start with battles in here. And I want to ask you, will you take some dominion this week? Will you take some authority this week? Will you take some of that, what God's deposited in you by His Spirit and say, God, I know in Jesus' name, I feel it. I feel hate slamming at the door of my heart in this relationship. Some of you have got a relationship going on and they're just right on the, I mean, it's just right at the door. If you crack that door, hate's going to rush in and you know it. And maybe you've already opened the door and it's responded and you let it run in and out, all that mess that comes in. You just feel it right there. And I want to invite you. Decide right now. Say in Jesus' name, I invoke love and I banish hate. I invoke the love of Christ. I invoke the love of Christ into my marriage. Some of you got some stuff going on at home. I invoke the love of Christ into my family and I banish hate from my marriage and my family. I invoke the love of Christ into my workplace and my setting. All that's going on there, I invoke love and banish hate in Jesus' name. I invoke the love of Christ and I banish hate from my locker room and team dynamic, whatever's going on. I invoke love and I banish hate. Wherever you have dominion, wherever you have rule, wherever you have influence, wherever your kingdom is, that you invoke love and you banish hate. That's how we do battle with this at the door of the heart. That's how we watch over it. Proverbs 4.23, watch over it above all else. We can't just casually let it run in and out. There's too much at stake because it determines the course of of our lives. So imagine with me the world when a group of people decide they're actually going to live Matthew 5, the power of Jesus' name, to love our enemies. Even those who hate upon us, we will love them, the power of Christ, and we'll banish hate and we'll see change. Let's pray. Father, I know this kind of dialogue brings up all kinds of emotions for all kinds of folks listening in this room and joining us online. And I just want to take a moment right now. I just want to ask you to break any agreements that have been formed around hate. I think there's some people who form some agreements when they've let hate into their heart. Like, I'm never going to be able to love that person. That's an agreement in Jesus' name that's going to be broken or I'm never going to be able to, or I always will this. That's, those are agreements. And be very careful when you open up the door of your heart and start forming agreements. It starts dragging you down a road. So would you just, by the power of your spirit, well up the love of Christ within us. Give us a love beyond ourselves to pour out upon all our relational worlds, all our dominions, all our kingdoms. And we long to see our world, Lord, marked with love and hate banished. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we wrap up, um, those of you online, your online host can direct you if you've got some things we need to be praying about. Uh, those of you in the room here, you can scan the QR code. That's a place you could submit prayer requests. We want to be a praying family to support you and stand with you. Whatever it is you're going through, please submit those. You can mark confidential or not. The confidential ones just go to the pastor's. The other ones go to the broader prayer team to be praying for and with each other. A few things before I send you out uh, with a benediction. Um, we've got some uh, activities coming up, specifically a midweek worship service, September 9th. So we're going to do an outdoor worship service on Wednesday night, September 9th. So some of you joining online who aren't comfortable coming in person inside yet, you have an opportunity September 9th, 7 o'clock. We're going to be outside on the north side of the building. We're going to set up a little stage. Many of you remember when we did that um, in June. We're going to do a similar thing Wednesday night, September 9th. Join us for that worship night. We've got two new discipleship classes about to start up. We've got an alpha class happening on Tuesday nights, and Julia's going to be teaching a Genesis class on Sunday mornings, eaglechurch.com slash events. You can sign up for that and check those out. And then we've got a baptism service on the 27th of September. So I mentioned to you last week, we're going to do baptisms because Jesus calls us to do baptisms. Some of you have never been baptized. Time for you to take that step. We're not quite sure what it's going to look like, and you're going to help us determine that. 
thankful that several families in the congregation who have swimming pools in their home, they've offered their pools. We could have some really cool backyard pool parties that are baptisms. That'd be super fun. If any of you want to do that, we can do that in a little bit more of a smaller private setting. Or if there's some of you comfortable and wanting to do it here in our main worship service, we'll pull out our baptismal tank and we'll work that. So we're willing to do all the above, but we need to start with go to eaglechurch.com slash events, fill out the baptism form if you're interested, and then we'll get in a dialogue with you. But keep the 27th of September on your calendars as that's when we're going to do that service together. And if we do a bunch of off-site, we'll just show some video footage in here and have a great celebration. Won't that be cool? I like seeing a bunch of people get baptized that way. And don't forget on your way out, if you can uh, pick up a t-shirt to support Trey Coley and family. Coley family, we love you and we think we're thinking of you. All right, let's stand up together, send you out with a benediction. As the thing about the benediction for this week, I thought about 1 Corinthians 13, the passage that often is quoted in weddings. There's a certain phrase, it's the, it's the paragraph that talks about what love is and how love is patient, love is kind, and that, et cetera, et cetera. Here's this phrase. It says in verse 5, love keeps no record of wrongs. And so I had a sense today that the Lord wants to pronounce a blessing and a benediction upon somebody or maybe a bunch of folks to release them from a record-keeping life. And so may the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who sent Jesus to the cross and rolled the stone away and sent His Spirit, May He send a fresh wind of that Pentecost spirit into your heart today. May He send you forth as a citizen of the kingdom of light to live no longer keeping a record of wrongs, that He'd give you freedom from that, that He would fill your heart with the love of Christ and release the offenses done against you, that you'd manifest love and banish hate in all your worlds this week. Go in Jesus' name.